Okay, very good morning to everyone. Hope you're well and have had a good weekend. It's Monday the 19th of March. Um, hope you're wrapped up warm. The mini beast from the east is back. So don't forget, you've got a, an interesting week for financial markets. So no being ill this week, please wrap up. You've got a lot of things coming out, namely a US interest rate hike, first one of this year. Uh, and then also you've got a really key EU summit obviously happening on Thursday and Friday. So getting straight into things then, let's have a look at how the charts are, are looking this morning uh, and we'll also have a look at um, some of the news flow from the weekend and what our expectations are just generally for the week coming up. So first things first, when you're looking at the charts this morning you can see in the index futures, both in the DAX in Europe here in the center left and the S&P on the center right, we've come under some downside pressure. Um, so the first things first is, you know, what's the reason behind that? And I can say that there is no new fundamental reason for that move, but certainly a technical break uh, looks the likely uh, reason behind the, the downside pressure. Don't forget in the DAX now, we are trading the June as the front month in terms of the contract as well. So if you're doing your uh, technical analysis this morning. If you're on CQG, it should have default rolled to the front month anyway. Uh, but just having a look at the DAX here, and the sell off came on the breach of what was uh, the S1 level. That was also the kind of opening futures low print. That was the low print from Friday afternoon. Uh, and you can see as well, it was in, uh, in focus in the middle of last week as well. So it was just literally the breach of that level. We ran through as well that previous low that was seen uh, towards the end of last week and it just shot down pretty quickly uh, through S1. And you can see we're just testing down at the lower bound of the price action that was seen on the morning of the 15th. So again, more technically led rather than anything fundamental. Uh, hasn't been too much on the news front. The one thing you did have at the weekend uh, not that I'm pinning this news on this move, but something to just be aware of. Uh, you did have a headline out of the Bundesbank and influential ECB member Jens Feidmann, who said that positive economic developments and inflation forecasts could allow the European Central Bank to quickly end its bond purchases. So this was in a, a publication. So this type of information generally comes out electronically on Sunday and it gets published in the papers for Monday morning. So Weidman, though, obviously he's been a, uh, a critic of ECB bond buying on large scale for some time. He's basically said the ECB had not decided when or how to end the practice, but market players expected the purchases to end around the end of 2018. Uh, and personally, he said, I think that good economic developments and inflation forecasts would allow a rapid end to bond purchases. So if you were looking at that, then certainly from a, a news perspective, that should equal equity weakness because what you're saying then is we're going to aggressively remove the economic stimulus, which has helped achieve these record high levels in, in European equity markets. So conversely, you can see here in the, the top left, the euro has firmed up a little bit. Um, so that inverse relationship just playing out at the moment uh, in that respect. But again, I think this is more just Weidman, not really too different from what he would normally say. So I don't think it's really that. I'd say it's more technically led the move this morning. Uh, otherwise, the dollar index is pretty flat. So if you're looking at these major currency pairs, uh, it's pretty quiet. Cable's just sitting here having found some resistance around the pivot at 139.96 in the futures, which is uh, just short of that 140 handle. Uh, I was just having a look at it on a slightly longer time frame. Uh, just some trend lines that have been in play the last couple of weeks, kind of last month really. Uh, it's played out a little bit more nicely in, really in the last two weeks more so than on the longer term. Uh, but we're going to look at cable a little bit more because obviously it's a big week for the EU summit uh, and consequently then sterling direction going forward. So let's just jump straight into that as a subject. And this is the headlines that you're seeing this morning. So UK wants Brexit transition locked in at the key summit this week. This obviously kicks off on Thursday, but will continue for two days into Friday. And Theresa May's Brexit negotiators want to secure a written promise on a transitional deal. That's what's the, the main objective from the UK government side of what they want to get done by the end of the week. To, so you're aware, in terms of 
how this process normally works. That's the official meetings. What it does mean is that closed door behind the scenes meetings are taking place likely throughout the entirety of the week. So EU's chief Brexit negotiator, uh, Michel Barnier and David Davis, his counterpart, are preparing to hold talks in a press conference in Brussels today, according to people familiar with the situation. So we'll be looking out for confirmation of that time. I would imagine that will probably be later on this afternoon. The other thing as well is that you're probably going to get people like The Telegraph, The Times, Business Insider, as we saw about three weeks ago, looking to run later source comments, so on and so forth, about the depth of discussion and how well it is or isn't progressing at this point, which could lead to some potential fast money moves and ability to be able to just react if you can get that information quickly in some short-term trades in, in volatility in the pound uh, and also likely in the FTSE. Some other details then. British negotiators are pushing for the EU to include an explicit statement in its negotiating guidelines at the summit. They want the document to state that an agreement in principle has been reached on the terms of transition. Uh, again, this is according to people unnamed but familiar with the matter. So again, Britain's objective here is to get an agreement in principle. So not all of the finite details. Uh, unless such a clear statement is forthcoming from the EU, the risk here is that financial services and other businesses are expected to accelerate their contingency plans in case there is no deal when the UK leaves the bloc in about a year's time. Obviously, the actual uh, end of Article 50 being of March of 2019. Uh, there have been, in terms of the current context, a few positive signals heading to the summit, according to Bloomberg. Um, they say, though, that in recent days, European officials have kind of hinted that they could try to delay the transition accord until Theresa May moves further to reassure the Irish government that there'll be no hard border with Northern Ireland after Brexit. So as has been the case for a, a long period of time, it continues to remain the kind of key point of contention is the border with Northern Ireland. Uh, and this reading between the lines of the, the news flow this morning, is what Europe might use as leverage to not sign off on a transitional agreement unless they've got more reassurance about the status of that of which the UK government has had no real concrete viable solution for the time being. Uh, so that's kind of how the, the land lies on the issue at the moment. Uh, one thing I did see this morning which could be quite useful just as a reference point uh, I did send this out as a research document to you from our friends at ING. And this is the looking at the different scenarios that the pound could end up doing going forward. Now, don't forget, for the UK, it's not just about this Brexit issue, which we've just discussed here. Um, you've also got some other things coming out. If I flick over to the weekly calendar, from the UK, you've got UK inflation rate, core inflation, so CPI data. You've also got uh, the latest wage data coming out of the UK and you've got the Bank of England interest rate decision. So there's four things to monitor in case of the pound this week. Brexit, UK CPI, UK wage data and the UK Bank of England interest rate decision and announcement. So four things. Now if you take those things into consideration this is what ING are predicting in terms of the scenarios and potential reaction for cable and euro sterling. So if, let's say, scenario one, you get a Brexit transition deal and UK economic recovery. They're looking at the most bullish case scenario for the pound then over the period being a move to 145. If they're looking at scenario two, Brexit transition deal, but a cautious Bank of England rate hike, i.e., at this present point in time, the next interest rate in the UK, in terms of a move higher in interest rates from the current 0.5%, is 70% probability for the month of May. Now, what they say in their minutes, which come out with every single interest rate announcement, again, we're not expecting any interest rate move from the Bank of England, but what is their language? Is it a hawkish hold to set things up then for the, for the hike coming in May. This is what will shape then either how hawkish or how cautious and dovish the Bank of England might sound. So scenario one and two though is taking into account a transition deal does happen. Scenario three, 
prolonged Brexit uncertainty and the Bank of England on hold, i.e. not just holding, but looks to do so for the foreseeable future, i.e. a lesser chance of a May rate hike. Therefore, cable, which is currently trading at a 140 handle this morning, you'd be looking for a push back down to 135. The fourth case scenario, which you can see here, would be a dramatic fall in the pound. Again, we're trading 140 to go to 125. This would be contingent on then Brexit breaking down completely, no deal, and also then as a byproduct, heightens political uncertainty, clouding the near term future, shackling the Bank of England's hands to hike interest rates. This also then would need the wage data and CPI data to also be on the, the weaker side. Uh, and then you would see a meaningful move lower. The reason why the move here on the scenarios is much smaller from the current price on the positive to much more negative is because the baseline scenario is that a transitional deal is secured, is that wages start to pick up, is that inflation remains up at around this 3% current level, and consequently then that the Bank of England will need to hike in May. So if that's where the markets are generally thinking as a collective, well then the, for this coming to fruition would mean a much smaller uh, move to the upside of five points. On the flip side though, we could fall 25 points because it's a tail risk. So it's not the base case scenario and this is a much lower probability and as such then the move much more violent if that was to, to come into play. All right, let's move on to a couple of other subjects and then we'll have a quick look at some of the charts in the week ahead. So this is looking at the dot plot matrix and this is overlaying a couple of other things. It's looking at the uh, latest overnight index swaps and how the market's priced, which is the purple line at the bottom. Uh, if you can just about see that, you've got the federal funds futures and where they're trading at the moment. And then you've got the line, the green line is the trajectory of interest rate hikes as telegraphed by the Fed in their summary of economic projections. So the reason why then the interest rate decision from the Fed is so important for this week is not so much because of the Fed interest rate hike. Well, let's quickly just have a look and we can see what the probability of, a, of an interest rate move is. And an interest rate hike from the Fed happening on the 21st is currently at 94.4%. So you can almost say that without doubt, the Fed are going to hike interest rates. Otherwise, the Fed have done a disaster in guiding the market. Um, if they didn't execute that rate hike, what is more important then is you can pretty much forget about this part of the equation. What's going to be the most important is this one. What is the shape here? Are we going to see a more, and this is the risk, a steeper rate trajectory going forward, i.e. 2018, could we move from three to four interest rate hikes? Now, if you think about what we've had, though, to influence this decision, I think you've got to take into account really three things. Two of those evolve around this key issue of inflationary conditions in the US. And if you think about the economic data coming inbound for the central bankers to interpret, those economic data points on inflation have been weaker. Non-farm payrolls, very strong job creation, but lackluster and inconsistent on the wage growth side. And then you had US inflation come out, which was basically in line, not moving higher as we might have thought at the beginning of February. The other final point is you've got this renewed uh, situation about trade wars being sparked off by US President Donald Trump. So is this the right time to start going into more hawkish mode right now, suggesting then that we should bump this up? And don't forget that it's a collective. It's not just one individual. The whole FOMC board needs to meaningfully shift up to alter the median dot plot for 2018. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that will come at subsequent meetings and communication thereafter personally. But this is what the market's going to be trading on. Uh, which is going to be paying very close attention. So don't forget that's happening on Wednesday night, which is going to be key for the direction of markets going forward. That does then take us into what does the, the shape of the week look like? And actually today is particularly quiet. I've just had confirmation of the time for the Brexit 
uh, speech. I've just said uh, that the two negotiators, Barnier and David Davis, are going to be speaking. I've just seen some news come down that the EU schedules Brexit news conference at 11.45. So 11.45, uh, so what, 11 or three hours from now, we're going to get some updated details of the current state of play. Very small probability if they say actually it looks very much likely we'll sign off a transitional deal and if that's a coordinated message from both speakers well then you could see the pound start rallying already as the market starts to pre-position itself for a positive outcome at the end of the week uh, but I'd say the likelihood is they've probably not got anywhere near that point uh, as yet so 11.45 look out for that for today's schedule, the point I wanted to make, and this is particularly relevant for the new guys who've moved over, moved over from stage two to three to trade live now for the first time today. Today is the least interesting in terms of the calendar. Later on this week, things like the Fed decision and what they communicate via Powell's first press conference and those projections is going to have a high impact on the market for the second half of the week. So if you're thinking about your trade strategy and your kind of allocation of where you want your attention and your capital, I would say you're gonna see much larger, clearer moves in the market in the second half of the week, not the first half. If you think about larger investors as well, from an institutional side, very unlikely they're gonna be stepping into the market ahead of these big events. If you're looking at the calendar as a whole though for the week, let's just have a quick run through. So looking at Tuesday, things certainly start to, to heat up a little bit. Um, UK inflation is the focus. And obviously if we just have a flip, flip over to what UK CPI looks like, it's been really consistent up at a fairly elevated level, obviously about 1% away from Bank of England target. Uh, expectations are, something similar will be seen again and again this also suggesting that the Bank of England can remain relatively hawkish in respect to the potential May interest rate hike. Uh, the problem the Bank of England have obviously is that their meeting comes on Thursday they're not going to know the outcome politically of these Brexit talks until the day after their event. So if you were expecting outright hawkishness, I think you might be disappointed because they're still going to have to err a sound of caution because they're not going to have all the details yet on how this EU summit is going to conclude. But they're definitely going to have the data. Otherwise, let's just focus on the UK then as we go through the week. That's on Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, you get possibly just as, just as important the wage numbers um, coming out. And I was reading a couple of things this morning in the research talking about uh, people's expectations are that their wages, they are expecting to go up in respect to the fact that minimum wage changes start to be inactioned at various different uh, price bands, so to speak. And so if wages are going up, similar reactions to what we've seen in the US, this then is like the catalyst for them potentially um, the divergence now coming back towards each other and so that the negative real wage growth situation starts to reduce uh, which is a more healthy situation for UK consumers in that respect and would be met more positively for the pound. Uh, then in the UK you get retail sales on Thursday morning with the Bank of England interest rate decision. So you can see lots of information with the conclusion of the EU summit article 50 on Friday. So apart from, well, with the speech coming up shortly, you've got it all week. So just be mindful of uh, being, I would say, realistic with time frames of holding open sterling positions, just given the frequency of headlines regarding Brexit that are likely to come, and then also the fact that you've got lots of major economic data littered throughout the week. Other things to be aware of, again, the big one, of course, is the Fed interest rate decision. You're going to get the summary of economic projections and the press conference, so it's the full Monty on Wednesday night. Don't forget, US clocks are still, it's four hours between London and New York. Our clocks uh, in the UK don't change uh, until the 25th. As such, then, again, major economic data from the US at 12.30 still for this week. That does mean that the Fed announcement will be at 6 p.m., with the press conference at 6.30 p.m. It's obviously an hour earlier than normal. 
All right, quick look at though the charts just to wrap things off because equities had seen a, a pretty decent move this morning. I just wanted to have a quick look at the S&P. I'll get Sam to just drop some charts into the chat room just to keep this, this wrap up as prompt as possible. Um, I just had one, well, here's one I marked up earlier from last week. And it does bring into some pretty um, significant levels here on a broader time frame. looking at a 240 candlesticks here. If I just identify where the market has seen a bit of a bounce in the futures around 27.35 this morning, uh, you can see that's been a, a relevant level here and on previous occasions quite a few times. So that's probably a decent level of support, I would say. Uh, you can even see here a little bit of consolidation before that eventual break right at the beginning of the year to all-time highs that we had. So if we were to get below that level, you got the 2700. So looking at broader levels for the week here, um, then you've got that low print that was seen. That would have been the beginning of, uh, what, two weeks ago, and then also late February. So 2686 would be a significant level sub that 27 handle if we were to get a, a meaningful break of this current test of 2735. On the upside, you can see those two points of consolidation around just short of the 2800 level. Really, it's that 2800 which has contained the price action from last week. Uh, which would be key on the opposite side of the range. Now, what you would need to retest, obviously, up at that 28 last week's high up here is you would need a rate hike from the Fed, but it would be a dovish hike. If you had that, then equities could see a decent move back on the upside. The fact that the Fed as yet aren't convinced on the inflation front and so therefore this slow, cautious, gradual rate hike normalization process is in play, equity friendly. On the opposite, let's say, and I'd say this is the lowest probability, the Fed come out and they change the dot plots to three to four hikes at the end of 2018, which is expected by some, like Goldman Sachs and BNP Paribas, for example, but the majority are not expecting that for those reasons I mentioned, trade wars, lackluster inflation data in wages and CPI. Uh, but if they were ultra hawkish, I'd be looking for the break of this and a push back down definitely to the lower bound of where we were trading uh, back at the beginning of March, if not targeting all the way back down, looking to get towards in the broader picture, all the way back down to that initial double bottom test that we had at the beginning of February. But I'd say this area is the key area really around here that you'd want to test in a hawkish scenario. All right, that's pretty much it. I am going to leave the wrap up at that and let you guys really get on with things. Um, for the guys, again, you've just transitioned over in our career program to trade live for the first time. Um, as I said, today, there's not too much going on in scheduled events. You've got that press conference coming up 11.45. Um, but don't feel a pressing need to want to jump in immediately. Uh, there's going to be plenty of good opportunity to come uh, in the latter part of the week. And I wish you all the best uh, with your first few trades live. All right. Have a good day. I'll see you in the chat room. Sam's going to share some charts as well.